now hear from the other uh, other side, from uh, the defense lawyer standpoint, we have Deirdre von Dornham. Uh, her brief background is she has a uh, master's in classics from Princeton University and went to Columbia Law School like I did, although we didn't know each other there. And um, she then, uh, I call it the triple crown. She was a law clerk, which is a, which is a very prestigious thing to do for Judge Brody in the Eastern District uh, of Pennsylvania at the district court level, Judge Reinhardt on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and Ned had the privilege to clerk for the legendary Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, she has spent most of her career at uh, federal defenders in the Eastern District of New York, I think almost two decades now, um, first as a, as a, as a, you know, a, a frontline uh, federal defender, and for the last several years, she is the attorney in charge of the federal defenders in the Eastern District of New York. Uh, she also has been a professor and an assistant dean at NYU Law School uh, along the way, and she certainly has a lot, a lot of experience in the area of sentencing. So, Deirdre, thank you uh, for joining us. Um, uh, before you talk about uh, sentencing in particular, I was just going to ask you to talk about how you approach as a defense lawyer generally representing your client. I think there is a perception among students, about the public, that a defense lawyer is trying to get an acquittal uh, for the client. That's their job, to get an acquittal. And we know that that's not the reality in many, many cases. Sometimes that's the reality, but in many other cases, the, the defense lawyer's job becomes much different. So how do you approach representation? Sure. I mean, I would love to have an acquittal in every case. So don't, <laughs> that's definitely my goal, but it's hardly ever possible in the federal system um, because the case agents, the police, everybody has done a lot of work before we ever get a case. Um, as public defenders, it's very different from private or retained counsel. We come to court and we're appointed to represent whoever is arrested that day. We don't choose our clients and they don't choose us. Um, and so the first obligation we have is to earn the client's trust and make sure they know that we are fighting for them and only for them. And unlike, you know, when the judge comes out and everybody immediately recognizes his authority or when Nicole comes out and they're like, oh, here's the government, you know, we're just kind of there in the corner, <laughs> you know, the public defender who you've seen on Law and Order. Um, and as with everything else in life, people genuinely and rationally believe that you get what you pay for. So, you know, there's often, and if you, you know, any movie you've ever seen, the public defender is always the schlump. Um, so, you know, my first job is to make clear that I'm going to fight super hard and that although the courts are paying me, which is another stumbling block for a lot of people in trusting us, um, although the courts are paying for me, that the only person I care about is the client. So I try to do that through body language, through what I say to them from the start, to being very explicit about, you know, you are my concern. And usually on the first day, getting you out on bail is my concern, um, making sure you go home today. Um, unfortunately, that's not always possible either, but we have a pretty high success rate in Brooklyn. Um, so that initial meeting is very important and that initial relationship forming. Um, and I, when I first took the job, you know, you just heard the judge say my resume. So probably you're giving my classics degree was not helping me um, know how to make people trust me, let alone people charged with very serious federal crimes. And I still remember my first ever client meeting on my first day of work with no training, where I walked in, it was going over a gun case with someone and, you know, giving a very erudite discussion of, the statute and the guy was like, am I going home? And I was like, oh, right, <laughs> he doesn't care like, the niceties of the statute, like focus on what he needs, which is I'm here for you. Here's how we're gonna get you home. Um, so that's always been what I cared about most. And I have found it really liberating because all the credentials the judge just talked about, my clients don't care about at all. That is not meaningful to them. And in fact, if they hear them, they're like, are you sure? Because otherwise she'd be making a lot more money. So the only thing they care about is what I do for them. Um, and that's really kind of awesome because it really sets you free from you know all the expectation and gold stars. Um, but it's also a big responsibility. Um, and as the judge says, particularly in the federal system, 
um, because as you heard Nicole say, there's some controlling of sentences by the prosecutors before we even get there, which means we're in a very reactive posture. In almost all cases, there's been a big investigation before we ever meet the client search warrants, wiretaps, you know, surveillance. So we're coming in, you know, I'm kind of trying to get the phoenix from the ashes. Um, and, you know, the client, one part that's hard about it is that in the federal system, you don't know what your sentence will be when you plead guilty. So in state court, as the judge said, um, the judge is involved in negotiations and nobody admits to having done anything unless they're told, okay, it'll be two to four years or, you know, the maximum you could get is five. Here, we're like, okay, tell them you did it and you'll get somewhere between zero and 20 years. It's a great deal. And I mean, no, again, no rational person thinks that's a great deal. And, you know, people will often say like, are you sure? Like, what do you mean? And then you go in for your guilty plea and Judge Bianco is like, in fact, you're pleading guilty to two drug charges. So I could run them consecutive and you could get 40 years. Your lawyer didn't tell you anything different, did she? And the poor client is like, what is happening right now? How is this possible? So developing that relationship of trust long before a trial or a guilty plea, let alone a sentencing comes is very important. Um, and obviously you can't promise a client anything. You can't say, here's the amount you'll get. You can say, here's what I know, you know, based on my experience. Um, but even that can be very difficult, even harder when Judge Gleason who's on and he'll talk to you the end was a judge because he would say to the person, don't plead guilty. You have a great lawyer. She'll get you acquitted. And I'm like, does this guy not think there's a reason I'm telling this person to plead guilty? <laughs> and then the client second guesses you even more. Um, but I'm sure he was trying to help. If I could ask you, Deirdre, um, that was great. But um, I'd also like you to focus as Nicole did about how you approach sentencing you and your client, I guess, together um, after he or she has pled guilty or been convicted, whatever, uh, by trial. Um, what do you do in advance of the sentencing in terms of a written submission? Um, and then we'll talk about how you, uh, what you do at the actual sentencing day. Sure. Um, and just to start with hearkening back to what Judge Bianco was saying about how emotional sentencing is. When I was a law clerk, I cried at almost every sentencing and the judge often had to ask me to leave, including when people got probation, because it just felt so overwhelming to me, this like sitting in judgment on another person and watching their families and seeing the effect on them. So I've tried hard over the years <laughs> to curb that impulse, but the whole process of it and of trying to narrate someone else's life and speak on their behalf to the court um, and as the judge said, trying to encapsulate the bad and the good um, and be candid is a very challenging job. So I try you know, to start preparing for the sentencing basically from the first day I meet the person to be paying a lot of attention to everything about them, their family, getting education records, getting mental health records, um, spending a lot of time talking to relatives and close family members, um, and being attentive to how, you know, for clients both who are detained, who are at liberty, how they can make their sentencing better from the day they're arrested. So like I had a guy that was arrested January 1st, uh, 2020. And he had a long record, but hadn't been in trouble for a while. And I said to him, okay, I'm gonna get you out on bail, but you gotta turn it around so that you never go back in. And he's one of the few people I've had who really has followed my advice. He got a great job. He has had a like a moment of trouble. And he's like, how am I doing? Am I working down? Will I not go to jail? Um, and, you know, people can do a lot for themselves with our support. So to me, the sentencing really starts by like helping people get in counseling, helping people get employment, because the judge is going to look at all of that. And it's one of the reasons why being detained really increases people's sentences. And there's a lot of studies on this that people who you know, don't get bail end up with higher sentences than people who were out on bail. Um, and a lot of that is because you can't, you know, there's not in the federal system and pretrial facilities, there's not jobs, there's not much in the way of programs. So you can't show the judge you've changed. So anyway, I try to take a very holistic approach 
um, and we have great social workers and paralegals. So we try to start, you know, ticking down. I start with the guidelines and say, okay, you're 48 months right now. Let's get you down to zero months by the day of your sentencing. Because my hope is always if someone's being sentenced that they can get time served or probation. Uh, and then for the written submission, I mean, we usually do written submissions in every single case. Um, some defense lawyers don't. We tend to in every case, even if there's a plea agreement with the government. Um, and part of that is the law, um, although the law is not usually our best argument. Um, and a lot of that is humanizing the client for the judge who may only have seen the defendant once or twice um, and during COVID, not at all. So it's really important to have that person, you know, be alive for the judge before the day of sentencing. I, if I could ask you, Deidre, in a few minutes we have left, and I know you're going to stick with us when we speak to Larry Williams in a moment, but um, I didn't mention to the uh, audience, Deidre has been involved in, in representing uh, Mr. Sarnev, who was convicted of the Boston bombing, sentenced to death, and Deidre uh, was not involved in the trial, but she was involved in the appeal before the First Circuit, where a few months ago they reversed the uh, death penalty portion of the conviction, and she's now waiting to see if that's going to go before the Supreme Court. Um, can you just speak a minute? I know you could go on at length about that representation, but I think we haven't really focused on conditions of confinement in jails. And if you could speak a little bit about uh, Mr. Sarnet's particular con conditions of confinement and just uh, very briefly about overall where, where that case stands. Sure, and this does tie into sentencing because um, if the government seeks the death penalty again in his case, then there'll be a full resentencing proceeding and they'll try to push for death and we'll try to push for life. If they don't pursue resentencing, then he'll automatically get a life sentence. Um, but as many of you probably remember, he's quite young. Um, he was 19 at the time of the marathon bombing um, and he had never before been in jail, not for a day, never been arrested, nothing. Um, and he's now been in solitary confinement in the Supermax facility, which is the most stringent federal facility um, in the country um, for the last four years. In Florence, so, in Florence Colorado? In Florence, Colorado, where nothing is nearby. <laughs> um, there's like groundhogs everywhere. Um, but so he's in a cement box. It's not a cell like you see in jail with the bars. There's he can't communicate with anyone. Um, and he's under what are called SAMs, which are special security measures put in place by the attorney general. Um, and the attorney general was concerned not about what Mr. Sarnayev might say to anyone, but about what others might make um, of his words, that they would you know, use his words as propaganda. So he's only allowed to speak to me and to one family member um, ever. So he goes, you know, days, weeks without talking to anybody with no, there's no outside light. There's no sensory sensation at all. Um, and again, he's not someone who had any experience of this. Um, he's limited in what books he can get. He's very limited. You know, he can't send anything out other than letters to me. Um, so it's a quite extreme case. And a lot of people who are held in the supermax develop mental health problems. Um, and so it's definitely something we keep an eye on. I talk to him once a week, um, for an hour, um, which, you know, is a, is a great privilege, but also very emotionally upsetting for me, um, to only have that much contact. Um, so if he's resentenced, we'll go back to Boston and do it, but hopefully he won't be resentenced. But even then, you know, the great thing we will have struggled for with our hundreds of pages of briefs and years of work is he'll be in that box for the rest of his life, which is probably another 60 years. Um, and it's an unusual case in that regard because the government did not contend that he was a future danger. I know the judge mentioned obviously that in sentencing, especially in a sentencing like this, that's the biggest concern. Is this someone who will hurt other people in the future? And there's very few people on federal death row who are not considered a future danger because that's why they got the death penalty. But in his case, the government said they didn't believe he'd ever do anything again. He just should get death for vengeance. And they were very clear about that. Um, so it's a super difficult case, um, but we're just keeping on you know, fighting every part of it. If you were presenting his 
position to a jury in a death penalty case, what, in, in, in a few sentences, what would you say in terms of why he shouldn't get the death, other than the issue of future dangerousness, what, what, what would you point to? Um, that he did it entirely under the influence of his older brother who had an extreme history of violence and was very wedded to a terrorist ideology. Whereas Jahar, who was seven years younger, had no history of violence whatsoever and no particular interest in ISIS or even in Islam um, and was very much brought into it by his older brother who had committed a triple homicide, including of his own best friend the year before and had told uh, Jahar a lot about that and kind of beat it into him. Um, so, you know, he did it under direct duress and coercion and there's no indication from anything else in his life that he would have done it were it not for his brother. Yeah, I think uh, the reason I asked you that, I think it's important for uh, the audience to understand, there's always arguments that'll work. Some people might say it's the Boston bombing. Obviously there's a lot of death and harm that was caused by right. that crime, but the lawyer can always find mitigating things to present, right? Yeah. Sometimes you have to look hard, <laughs> do a lot of investigation. <laughs> This one oddly is one of the worst crimes I've been involved with, but there's the most mitigation. All right, thank you very much, Deirdre, and I, I'm hoping you'll stick with us.